Namaste, good morning, and welcome to yet another episode of Dekho Apna Desh webinar series. Viewers, it's been a tough uh, last few weeks for us in India as the COVID has researched uh, its head and is troubling many lives. It's, it's, uh, it's a period to be extremely, extremely careful. And we also bow our head to all those who have lost their lives in the last few weeks and months to the pandemic. And we also salute the doctors and the frontline workers, the society at large, the non-for-profit organizations, the community groups, individuals, and everyone who has come forward to take care of each other. We hope and we are sure that with the sustained efforts of everyone coming together and looking after each other, we shall soon have the pandemic behind us. And all that is reason to cheer in human life should also be back. But for now, we salute everyone who is joining their hands, not only within India for us, but friends and support coming in from all over the world, whether from the UK, whether from the USA, whether from the neighboring countries, everyone is pitching together to make sure that the pandemic leaves the humanity sooner. So all the best to everyone and do keep safe and do take care of yourself. While we are at home and while we need to take care of all the protocols around COVID, we've been trying to bring you a virtual journey of our beautiful, incredible India. And that journey carries on because that's part of our karma. And therefore, we feel the need to keep bringing to you so many different vignettes of India. A lot of times we've brought to you India from the eyes of the Indian. But today we're going to try and bring you from a very different lens. We have with us somebody joining in from South of Wales, somewhere close to Cardiff. So welcome, Niall McCann, to Deko Apna Desh. Deko Apna Desh literally translates as see your country, but here it's more of a metaphor for see the incredible India. So welcome to Incredible India and thanks for joining in. It's really early morning for you. And so we really appreciate your joining in in what, about 6.30 for you a.m.? It is that, yes. Yeah, so sorry if I look a little bit tired, but, but I'll, I'll do my best to be coherent. <laughs> you look fine. And uh, it's indeed such a pleasure for us. And for all those who know Niall, and for all those who do not know Niall, he is an avid India lover. And that doesn't need to be said, right? And that's why he's up at 6.30 and conversing with us. But he's also a conservationist, an adventurer, and a TV presenter. He's visited India three times before and has, in different roles, been walking through Assam, the Manas National Park, the cyclic tour in the dark, and making documentaries in West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Maharashtra. Let me tell you, Nath, a lot of us in India may not have done as much as you have done as somebody coming from overseas and seeing India. And that really, really makes us feel really happy when people from overseas come, because in India, we really, we welcome our guests. We love to have a guest over, and I'm sure you know that. And we will be talking more about that. But taking you today on this journey of discovering what India is all about is Bindu. Bindu Menon is not new to Dekho Apna Desh. She's already done a fantastic webinar with us. Bindu helps uh, as part of her profession, relocate and realign and readjust and fall in love with India to the expatriates who come and work in India, who come and live in India with their families. A lot of them have chosen to make India their home. And I think part of it is uh, Bindu's responsibility to make that happen. Because when you land up in a foreign land, everything is new, the food, the culture, the customs, the way you go about, the small things, the big things, and so much changes. But the importance of somebody who is there to receive you, welcome you, and show you those so little fine nuances that help you to integrate and enjoy a culture in the way that it should. Bindu, of course, is an avid India lover that goes again without saying, and she's a writer by passion. And she has been working for more than 15 years now with expatriates of different nationalities, helping them to fall in love with incredible India is how I would look at it. So welcome Bindu once again, and thanks for taking this up. And also thanks for uh, taking on the journey today for incredible India with uh, Niall and we look forward to hearing from both of you. So I'm going to pass on the web stage to you, Bindu, for now. Thank you so much, ma'am. That's a very nice introduction. Thank you. And good morning, all viewers. And like ma'am said, yes, 
a huge salute to all the medical professionals who are doing their best to and the government for all that they are doing to keep us safe and keep us hopeful for a brighter future. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Niall McCann. Please do visit his website, nilemccann.com and know more about him because there's so much you need to know about him. Um, I'm going to let Niall talk much today because he has lots to talk about his experiences in India. And in his own words, he says he can go on talking about India. So somewhere I need to hold the string too, because he can get carried away. He's literally, he loves India so much and his experiences have been so bright and so uh, positive. So that's what, and um, as part of my profession, when I hear, uh, you know, we all love our own country. It's, that's, so there's a natural bias towards our country when, you know, when we stand up for it or like me, I wear India on my sleeve all the time fiercely proud of what I do in this country and, you know, helping expats understand or, like I say, make sense of Indian business culture or social culture for that matter. But I'm saying um, when I hear, every time I hear from an expat about India and I, I hear what a fascinating country it is and, you know, how do you people manage with so much chaos and you people look so disorganized, but you still manage so beautifully and there's so much to learn from you and then they talk about the food and, you know, it makes me feel swell, literally swell with pride. And I say that it's always a pleasure to hear from somebody from outside India that, you know, they love our country. And who better than Niall? Because he has come on pleasure and on work here. And he's come in search of adventure. He's come in search of the wildlife. He's come in search of uh, uh, exploring the country's natural heritage. So this is a message for all of you, especially the youngsters today. I want all of you to know from Nile that there is so much in India, like you'll hear him say this, but he says it's when you think about safaris and wildlife, you only think of Africa, but it's so it's, you know, it's as, as good as Africa here or even better, like he would say. And like we always tell our expats, India is not a country, it is a continent. So even when you want to travel in India, you have to plan your travel based on the region or a few states put together, you know. Uh, or your interests for that matter, if it's wildlife or history or food, you can do any kind of tours today. And the other thing I wanted to touch upon now is we have this Sanskrit, um, you know, it, it, it's a phrase that says, Atiti Devo Bhava, which literally translates as guest is God. We tell our expats about this every time. We say when, the, when there is somebody from outside India visiting our country, we say it could be God in disguise. It's just symbolic. It's a nice way to put it. So, which is why you will find us doing so much to make you feel at home, to make you feel comfortable. When we feed you, we literally stuff you and we make sure that you eat all that we have to offer and so on. So don't be overwhelmed. It's just our hospitality. It's our love for people who are coming from outside India that is just uh, you know, show, showing when, when we meet you. Now, I won't take much time. I will quickly pass it on to Niall, who's going to tell us about his experiences starting from his first cycling tour in 2006. But I would ask Niall to start talking about his illustrious family first, because his grandparents, his parents, they've all been in this, in this space of environment, conservation, um, wildlife, biology, and so on. So let him do the talking. So on to you, Niall. Thanks, Bindu. Uh, kind introduction and yeah thank you for welcoming me here it's, it's an it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk about my experience in India as I've had three trips and just a wonderful time every time I'll try and speak slowly I get excited and speak very quickly but I will, I will try and speak <laughs> slowly so that everyone can hear me because there might be a little delay from here in Wales but my, my desire to travel and to explore places very much came from my family. Um, in particular, my, <clears throat> my mother's father, my grandfather, was an explorer who spent a lot of time in the Arctic and he's got parts of Baffin Island in Canada named after him. He was the director of the Arctic, director of the Arctic Institute of North America. He won the Founders Medal from the Royal Geographical Society. He was a professor of geography at McGill University and various other places. So we, 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 we always had this sense that adventure and research and an appreciation of the natural world was just a part of our personal family heritage. He very much passed that on to my mother. Her first big expedition was aged 14 when she spent six weeks in the Arctic in Canada as the camp cook on a big expedition with her, with her father. And then her first trip to India was by truck over land aged 22 when she came from, from London Waterloo by a truck all the way over to Delhi 
and, and then spent some time in northern India before returning to the UK. And that would have been in 1970. So there weren't that many uh, young Canadian women uh, in India at that time. So it was quite unusual, I think, to be a, 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 a Western lady traveling that way and coming to the country. And my father was also very much an adventurer, traveled all around the world. And he was a biologist. He was the head of seal research for the British Antarctic Survey, living and working in Antarctica. My mum was also a biologist. So from a very young age, me and my brothers, we were surrounded by a, a, a desire to see wildlife, to, to travel to new places, to experience new cultures. And it was no surprise when the, me and my, my two brothers also became biologists as well. Um, went to university to study zoology and to become professional biologists. There was, there was really nothing else we were going to do with our lives when you've got a family like that behind us. So um, Niles, uh, one of Niles' brothers, Rory McCann, does a fantastic uh, job of explaining and teaching children to love their environment with his murals. You must look him up sometimes. It's fantastic. So as a family, I think they're doing so much on their own to, to do, uh, you know, protect the environment, as you say, to conserve wildlife. So Niall, uh, tell us about your cycling expedition uh, in 2006. I mean, what made you, for me, it is more interesting to know that how did you think of India? Back in 2006, we were not even a literally a cycling friendly country, I would say. I mean, today you see a lot of cycles, people go cycling, whether it's in the cities or people go on expeditions, there are weekend uh, biking, you know, tours and so on. But what made you choose? I think you, your father and your brother came down on that trip. And um, I'd like to know from you, Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it was me, my, my father, my brother, and one other friend of, of my dad's. A few years before, in 2000s, um, I, I, me and my father and that friend of ours, whose name is Stuart, we'd cycled the, the old Silk Road and the Karakoram Highway from Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek and Kyrgyzstan, down into Western China, Xinjiang province, and then over into Pakistan, over the Kunjarab Pass, which is the highest paved pass in the world, just over 4,800 meters. And a few years later, when my brother was reaching a similar point in his education, um, that's relevant actually. So, so when, when we finished school before we went to university, as a re reward for passing our exams, our father would give us a big expedition. So mine was to go and cycle over the Kunjarab Pass, and then when my brother finished his exams before he went to university, the reward was to go uh, on another big cycling trip. And we had to choose where that was going to be. India has the highest navigable road in the world. It's the, the Kardung La, which is north of Leh on the, towards the border with China. And after having ridden the highest paved pass, the natural progression was to the highest road that you, that you can ride. But we didn't just want to to start there we wanted to see a little bit more of the country so we looked more into uh, into the area and it, there seemed to be a sensible route from Manali up to Leh which lots of people do on their Royal Enfield motorbikes and stuff but but no one was really cycling it at this point we decided that, that this was going to be our aim so we, we flew into Delhi then uh, took a taxi ride up to Manali and then off off we went over to over to Leh and then out up, up onto the Kardung La and it was, yeah, it was quite a trip. I'm sure we'll get into it. But the main reason was because India has the highest road in the world and that's what, was what we wanted to ride. So this is the point where I'd like to ask, um, before you came into India, you would have had um, perceptions of India in your mind, right? I mean, from what you read, from what you've seen on television perhaps, or, and then when you came in, I, I know I have had several expats tell me this, that it is so different. Like we have this line we, which we always quote, Whatever you hear of India, the opposite is always true. We start by saying that because when you come in, you, there are people who think we are all snake charmers and elephants on the roads, and then you see BMWs, and then you, you know, you, everything is so different from what you actually read about. Even today, if you read about uh, India on the internet, I, I always tell them that, okay, fine, come back and check with us because it is not so. Um, so what is your, what was your perception, the before and after picture I'd like to know? It's really hard to remember what your perception was before because of course it's colored by by my experiences in india now um, but what i would say about india is is that it all of the things that you've said are true you you still have your snake charmers and your elephants by the road and you still have your your your, your bmws and, and what i love about india is that it meshes pride with your with your own local culture 
with acceptance and adoption of other cultures. It's, it's an extraordinary blend of cultures and experiences. And people in India do that incredibly well, um, maintaining whatever culture they have, wherever they're from, with dashes of other cultures, be that food or, or, or whatever it is. And so for me, that was the thing. India has to be experienced. The, the, the sights, the smells, the interactions, the sounds, everything. You, you cannot prepare yourself for what it's like to, to land in Delhi and go for a walk in old Delhi. It's, it's, it's an incredible experience. You have to really feel. But then likewise, up in, up in Ladakh, which is much more sparsely populated, you still have this incredible buzz. And I think that's, that's what's truly remarkable about the country is you're the largest democracy in the world. Everybody feels engaged in some way in how the country runs. And there's a buzz about it that is hard to replicate. And you don't really see in many other places. There's, there's just, there's a busyness, but it's purposeful. Um, and it's an extraordinary place. What, what I love is when you travel 13 hours from, from Delhi to Manali and then two weeks from Manali up to, De to Leh, we travel through such a diversity of cultures and places and people and that, that continent's worth of diversity in a, in a single country is is almost unique so this is uh, again you know when you said sights and sounds we tell uh, our clients that when you come into india it's almost like your five senses are invoked you know mm -hmm. because you get us you get everything around you and then that can be overwhelming that can be truly fascinating for some um, and then when you when you leave you take with you some some part of it also right and that's what you can tell us about when, when you finished your, or how the journey was, and when you left, what it felt like. Uh, how was the food on Nile? You're a foodie, I know. So you can tell us a little bit about what your first, is that the first time you tried Indian food? I mean, but you're in UK, you might have, you know, had the UK version of, the, uh, of Indian food, but how different was it when you came to Delhi? Because um, we've heard people telling us that, mm, butter chicken didn't taste like this when I had it in London. So, that's Indian nice. food, as you know, is incredibly popular in the UK. So I, I'd grown up with what I thought was Indian food, but really, actually, it's mainly Bangladeshi people that, that, are, that are calling themselves Indian and, and, and right. because it's easier to market themselves. So actually experiencing real Indian food, North Indian food, so tandoori, um, was, was quite something. On the trip itself, we were really, really uh, Spartan with our food. We were mainly cooking for ourselves, and that was... Uh, yeah, it was lentils and then just a few little spices that we would throw in. You'd be cycling for 10 to 12 hours in a day. So by the end of the day, you're very, very tired. And of course, when you're up at altitude, it takes a long time to boil anything. We were cycling at over 5,000 meters for, for, for quite a long time. Lentils should, should cook in about 20, 20 minutes, half an hour here, in, here at sea level. But up at 5,000 meters above sea level, it would take hours for them to cook. So, so we, we just didn't have enough gas in our stoves to cook them so we ended up basically just eating half raw lentils the entire time so as as someone that loves his food we did not experience the best of india's food on that on that first trip subsequently with you i had a a, a completely different experience from a culinary perspective of course but that first trip really our our eating was functional we were we were having to fuel our bodies because we were cycling for 10 right. to 12 hours a day all we needed was 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 fuel so it was very functional. And when we were stopping and eating at, at local establishments, really it would be roadside cafes, just a local person that had set themselves up to, to, to host travelers coming through. So again, the food was really basic. There was a lot of Maggie noodles. We, we ate a lot, a lot of Maggie noodles and a lot of one egg omelets. Uh, how I dreamed of a two egg omelet when I was up there. Um, so so yeah, it, it, it certainly wasn't the culinary trip. Nor was it particularly cultural for many for many reasons. We 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 were focused on the expedition, enjoying the cultures that we went through. But 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 really, what we were there for was the scenery, just to to soak up the amazing scenery. And again, I think when when people think of the Himalaya, they think of Nepal, and a significant portion of the Himalayas is, is in northern India. And that as we crossed over into Ladakh, you go from really kind of lush. Wet, wet landscape in, in the south towards Manali, and then you cross over into dry Ladakh, high peaks. You start to see really big mountains for the first time, six, seven thousand meters. 
that was truly extraordinary. And we, we also came across the area where the continents meet, where, where, where India meets, uh, meets up with the rest of Eurasia. And the incredible geology of that place uh, was, was wonderful to me. You've, you've got wonderful ar archeology, span but to have that geology in the country as well. And Stuart, who came with us as a geology teacher, so he, he was beside himself with excitement at, at, at the diversity of geology that we saw as we traveled. So that was really our focus, was, was on the physical challenge of what we were doing and on the incredible geology and geography around us, just taking in that scenery and, uh, yeah, and enjoying everything that it threw at us. Uh, now that cycling is is a is a passion, it's become a sport today in our country, and in, especially in today's environment where health is becoming a you know a supreme important uh, factor. You you, know, you you might want to just tell the youngsters or anybody any cycling enthusiast out there about uh, what they need to what they can do in our country, especially if they were going up to the Himalayas. There are many people going on expeditions right now. Even in the corporate circles, I see a lot of them posting on LinkedIn saying, oh, we went there and, you know, we've been to the Mount Everest. So it's become a little bit of a fad too, but perhaps if you tell them what exactly they need to go with in their mind, like what is more important when they go there. It's not about just reaching Mount Everest, taking a picture and saying, I've been there, done that, you know, it's something more about respecting the mountains, respecting the environment around and, you know, being more responsible when they do that. Yeah. Well, no, no matter how you're traveling, you should be a responsible tourism. There's, there's the idea of leave no trace. So, right. so, so wherever you go, leave, leave no trace of where you've been, take only pictures, right. leave only footsteps. Cycling is a wonderfully inobtrusive way to travel. Uh, you're, you're engaged with your environment because you're, you're, you're in the open, you're out, out with it, but you're moving fast enough to, to, to cover great distances as well. Whereas when, when you're in a vehicle, you're really not engaged in your environment in the same way. You, you can't have a, a conversation with someone as you're, as you're going past, uh, which you can on a bicycle. And there's so much to be said for traveling by bike. For me, it, it, was, it was my gateway drug into adventure because it's, it's accessible, it's easy. All you need is a bicycle and a bag to carry your stuff. You really don't need much equipment at all. And it's, you can get into some wonderful places. It's a great healthy way to travel. It's brilliant for fitness in terms of your personal carbon footprint, reducing how much you cycle and uh, reducing how much you drive and cycling instead is a very positive thing that you can do. There's so many health benefits. But for me, it's, it's the fact that you, you are so in touch with your environment when you're on a bicycle. And when, when you're somewhere as spectacular as Northern India, you want to be in touch with that environment. So um, from here, I think, Niall, maybe we should just, because I'm looking at the time too, we should move down. You've got two more places, not just two places, but two more experiences, which can take some time. Let's come down to Assam, which was 2016, right? You had That's visited right. two national parks, Kaziranga and Manas National Park. Um, we'd like to hear that without losing much time again. So I was mainly spending time in Manas National Park where there's a lot of anti-poaching operations happening and 2016 was the time when I was starting to get particularly interested in anti-poaching work, which is now uh, the main part of my job. And I visited a program up there, which uh, was the Forestry Department of India and a couple of NGOs that are also supporting them. And Manas is something else. It's very remote, unlike Kazaranga, which gets a lot of tourists. Manas has almost no tourists at all. Um, and it's, it's full of wildlife. It's still got a really decent population of tigers. It's got a lot of elephants. It's got a breeding population of rhinos, lots of water buffalo, gaur, and then these, these pygmy hogs, which are uh, critically endangered and um, are culturally iconic, your Bengal florican birds, you've got giant hornbills, just such an incredible diversity of wildlife. And uh, at the foothills of the Himalayas. So Manas has a, a plain, a big plain, then it starts to rise up into Bhutan. And then you get into Royal Manas National Park in, in, in Bhutan. That, that, that transition was, was fascinating, being in the grasslands and then up into the forest as they get lush and humid and the wildlife changes. So I, I was fortunate to spend over three weeks there. I spent a lot of time with, um, with the Bodo people that were working, um, that live in the region and that were working in the national park. And for me, that was, it was a perfect mix of culture, uh, culinary delights, 
and and wildlife it was it was a fantastic trip and gave me a for the first time a sense that india can compete with africa when it comes to safari if you're if you're looking for a, a wildlife experience an up close wildlife experience with with megafauna with, with your your enormous big animals india india could go toe to toe with kenya and to be honest if you want to get really close to wildlife I found India is a better place to safari than East Africa or South Africa for those close up experiences. And in a way that's so surprising because people don't think of India as a destination for safari. But my goodness, is it is it special? It, re it really is. And when I when I take my daughter to India sometime in the future, one of the first things we will do is we, we will go on a safari. Yeah, I, I'm listening with pride because you know I can see the passion and the you know the, the the fascination on your face when you when you explain all this, right? I mean, it makes me want. We have not a lot of us haven't seen the northeast or any side. Each region is different. Like Absolutely, Bindu. I'm just going to come in on that because that it got me excited too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kyle. As to uh, what do you think? You've been traveling around the world a lot, and I'm so happy to hear you compare uh, India's wildlife experiences literally toe to toe and in some ways even uh, even more exciting i have two questions to you on that what do you think are we not doing enough in terms of creating the outreach why do people not know about it and the other thing that i would like you to focus on is that when we are talking about the understanding of the overall ecosystem do you think there is a lack of perception in how we organize ourselves for these safaris? Is that the problem? I'm just trying to identify the problem area there. Interesting question. My, my, my guess is that there probably hasn't been a focus in India on ex exploiting your, your natural resources for wildlife tourism. There's, there's presum I, I don't want to, um, to assume too much, but, but, but my guess is that the focus has been on cultural tourism and on business tourism. Whereas really, uh, ecotourism is an enormous, enormous potential earner of GDP. If you look at Botswana, for example, 10 to 12 percent of their GDP is off ecotourism. India has similar levels of wildlife to, the, to these countries that are in, in East and Southern Africa that are earning significant portions of their GDP. And I think it needs to be a focus with the younger generation. Wildlife watching is something that is incredibly popular, incredibly desirable. People are connected to the world and they want to see wildlife. They want to go to wild places. And I think I, I, would, I would envisage ecotourism being a major sector of growth in Indian, in Indian tourism over the next few years, if you advertise yourselves well. I, I remember years ago visiting Rwanda in, uh, in East Africa, and there were billboards everywhere saying more than just gorillas because people only get, think about the mountain gorillas or, or, or they think about some of the negative historical connotations of Rwanda. And I think when people think about India for safari, they think of tigers, but I, I would like people to think, think beyond tigers. You have an amazing diversity of megafauna. And then the smaller things as well that I really like, you've got unbelievable numbers and diversity of snakes. And to someone like me, that's really appealing. <laughs> it's not necessarily appealing to the general public, but to me it is, it really is. So there's definitely a niche in, in, in uh, herpetological circles, so it's, um, reptile loving circles of people that should come to India. For bird watching, for all of these things, I think it's, it's about moving people's perception beyond tigers to, to explain that there is an incredible diversity of wildlife and the opportunity to see them at close quarters. Uh, that, that's a valuable insight and I think uh, I totally agree with you that we just have not taken it out enough in our outreach and uh, while yes the culture the dance forms the art forms are a wealth but probably somewhere the entire thing either it needs to marry with each other as a holistic experience or probably in any case also separately focusing the diversity is, is absolutely immense. I think we've uh, done a few webinars on uh, nature, wildlife, on birding, and, and the list is going on and on because every time that we ourselves host a webinar and we realize that how little we know of our own country, there's just so much, so much to be done. There are 250 plus nature parks and the kind of diversity which you're talking about is absolutely enthralling. 
depending on your area of interest, whether it's the reptiles or whether it's the birds, it's just mind blowing, I think. And we do need to do a lot more work on that from what I can make out. An area of interest for me with India on wildlife is that wildlife is incorporated into a lot of the religious practices in the country as well. And, and so for people that were wanting to experience culture, but also wildlife, for me, the trip in 2019, when, when, when Bindu was, was our cultural guide, was important because we were spending a lot of time with Adivasi people who have a really, really close relationship with wildlife. It's, it's an integral part of their culture. And so, so for, for me, I was getting that, that, that dual experience of, of spending time with Bhagavad, uh, mm -hmm. while also spending time with, with these Adivasi people. It was, that, that was really special. And, and I think that's something that India, India should be proud of, is the integration of wildlife into your culture it's an integral part of like, a significant portion of your deities are based upon the wildlife in your in your country and, and and that should be a point of pride so true and i think if you've had a chance to visit some of the more indigenous communities the tribals the way the life gets integrated around the local plants the herbs the animals the customs everything that is still so closely aligned to nature's elements so that, that's something we do believe about India that while at one hand we drive the Silicon Valley and we have some of the finest uh, scientists driving research around the world but we also still are a country who believes and lives with nature very closely but probably I think that's where we need to be carrying that message a little louder and more sharper to people who are trying to visit India. I think it, it's a very, very valuable insight. I also wanted to ask you about the geological uh, bit that you touched on. And that's another dimension that remains pretty much ignored about India. Most people would not associate a geological uh, wealth with India. Uh, would you like to expand a little bit on that? Anywhere that you have a, a meeting of continents, as you do with India meeting Eurasia, you will have areas of geological interest and the, 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 the folds in, this, in the rock and the soil were just spectacular to see the colours of the rocks, the colours of the soils, all of these things. It's, that northern part of India is so incredibly convoluted. There's, there's so much interest to be had in every nook and cranny. If, 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 you, if you're only willing to go and look, Stuart, who came with us as a geology teacher, his mind was blown by some of the stuff we were seeing. These rock strata thrust up in incredible angles. Uh, it, was, you know, it was a privilege for me to be next to someone having that level of, of excitement for a rock that I have when I see an elephant or something. Uh, and yeah, that's, that, that's always interesting, traveling with people with different, different specialisms because they can get so fired up about whatever it is they're seeing. Um, so anytime we saw a vulture, I would, I would be able to I would go wild and anytime we saw a new uh, okay, pyroclastic flow, then uh, Stuart would go wild, for example. I, uh, of course, meandering very different topics. Um, just a question to somebody, you are an English speaking person and in India we find English is fairly, fairly uh, well spoken, even at the grassroots level, even at the hinterland, everybody will have a few words that they will let you get by. But do you think for visitors coming from countries that do not really understand English or speak English, is language an issue, do you think, for people who are traveling to India or uh, is not an issue? That would have been an issue more, whereas most people, most people these days do have a smattering of English. It's, it's become the lingua franca, for, for better or worse. And that's really been the last few years that, that, that that's happened. When, when I first was traveling a lot as a youngster in my late teens and early 20s, English was not spoken in, in, in remote communities. So when we were in northern Pakistan, there was no English really there. Where, whereas only five, six years later, um, finding myself in northern India, spending time with tribals, still there was some English in there. And I, I found when, when speaking with people from different cultures in India, they settle upon English as the kind of co as the common language, or at least s smatterings of English. They throw in a few English words here and there. So, really, I, I, it, language shouldn't be a barrier to people. I, I, I can't speak for your average Russian tourist as to whether they feel that that's that that's a barrier, but it shouldn't be. And and even if it is, then that shouldn't be a reason not to travel. Coming to a place, I want to experience the local languages as well. I want to hear the different sounds. One of the things I um, I spoke to Bindu and 
Nilanjan and a couple of my other um, local cultural guides when, when, when I was in India in 2019 about was wh what words exist in different Indian languages that don't exist in English or in other European languages, because like, we've got lots of words that are just missing from our language. And I, I discovered there was one. So I can feed you food, but in English, I can't do the same with, with drink. I can't feed you drink. I can't water you. I can't drink you. I can't wet you. None of that works. And speaking to Nilanjan and Bindu, I understand that word does exist in either Assamese um, or, or one of those languages and doesn't in Hindi. And, and that was a fascinating thing for me was that this, this missing word, which I can't find in any European languages, I found in one of the Indian languages. Very interesting. So I'm going to ask you a couple of more questions before I pass on the, the stage back to Bindu is that in India, we are a lot about people. We are about how we deal with people. Would you like to reflect back and remember one or two experiences that you had with people where you either got stuck or you had a problem or some act of kindness or something that really endeared you to that person while you were in India? Over and over again. <laughs> so yeah, every single time. Just the acceptance I think has been interesting. Turning up at, at, at a tribal's house where they, they've really got very little and instantly, a cup of tea will appear and then some some sweets will appear and you're straight away accepted into their family and into their home and and treated as a special guest even even in situations i remember in one of the slums in um in, in mumbai late at night we were walking through the slum and there was some music coming from a little temple and i'd be a little bit wary i suppose of being being uh, a white person standing in a, in a religious temple, but we were immediately brought in and asked to, to enjoy this. They were singing and they were playing on some drums and some bells. It was an amazing experience for me to be dragged in off the street and, and, and asked to take part in this. Whereas I know in the UK, you, you wouldn't be pulled off the streets and brought into a church. Uh, that, that, that would not happen. So to have that was, was really special. So, for me, it's that, that generosity and the desire to share their culture was, was something. And I think that they wanted me to experience what they were experiencing. And, and that was a real privilege, real pleasure. Fantastic. Dindu, I'm going to let you carry on. Thank Did you. I get excited about something else? <laughs> Please come in. Yes. That's for, cut right in. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you should hear this, ma'am. There's one webinar that I think we hosted where um, this was about new age women in uh, tourism. And I think that is a fantastic uh, solution to what you were talking about now, both of you, about languages and, um, you know, discovering what is there in your backyard in which you didn't probably know all this while. And um, I think one of the quiz questions in this, in this webinar itself is about a, a massive rock, which is 2.5 to 3.4 billion years old, which is in a city. I'm not going to give the answer here, but I'm saying um, that is that was a shock even to me. So I'm saying... Um, Perhaps that format. So now, just to get you into this, um, what they are doing in that particular webinar is that they're bringing in local. Uh, it could be from the tribals, it could be from the villages, women, girls, young girls, and then you know training them to be the local guides because mm -hmm. they know what it is, you know, to go into the backyard and say, oh no, don't worry, there won't be snakes inside, or you can you can do this, or you can't do that. So you're giving them an opportunity to actually come into the world and do. Uh, live with dignity with a job like this and to welcome guests from outside India to speak a little bit of English. It's not that you, they need to speak fluent English, but as long as they are able to speak, communicate and take them around and show them the best side. That was a fantastic webinar. It was an eye opener for me because I'm, you know, I've been working from my hometown in Kerala since December and I'm seeing the local girls out here and I'm saying this is what I should be doing if I ever open my home for, you know, homestay to the, you know, outside world. I said, I'm going to bring this girl and I'm going to train her. I'm talking to people in English and they love it. And they're all on the smartphones today. And so they're all very, very clued into social media. And the minute I click a picture of somebody in the local villagers jumping into a pond, those guys, those kids want to ask me, are you on Insta? And then they want to know whether, you know, yeah. so it's, it's fascinating to know that they are so digitally connected today and language really isn't a barrier because they don't know to type English as much as we would, but you know, they're still there. So getting the locals to be involved in marketing or to the outreach programs, I think is a fascinating um, option, which you've already explored in that webinar, um, MOT has done it. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, uh, thanks for bringing that up. In fact, Bindu, I think in a country like India, where there's just so much to showcase, right. every home literally has a story, has a tale. The the potential of uh, bonding at the community level and creating that kind of wealth not only will create a lot of economic wealth across, but also saves uh, so much of the local resources being put to use and people not migrating to cities, that whole need to remain connected to your culture, the preserving them. Because the moment you have somebody else coming and appreciating your culture, you know, that's when you say, oh, I want to preserve that. And I think that is so important in old civilizations like ours, where over centuries and millennia and millennia, we've grown, we are what we are today because of the thousands of years behind us. And what all are those valuable heritage traits, whether tangible or intangible, that we need to be protecting and taking along as we grow as a modern country. I think those are such beautiful learnings when we work at the community level that empower them to, to have a voice and to create an outreach. I think, and uh, that's where uh, Niall, I think people like you are extremely valuable, I would say. And that was a conversation I was having with Bindu in the morning that when you are living somewhere, as she rightly also said in the beginning, it's home for us, you know? So you kind of sort of take a lot of things for granted. They're just there. If I am chewing on something which is good for my belly because my grandma said it, I'm just doing it because I was born into it. But there's so much wisdom in those things. And when you have somebody coming from other cultures, coming and looking at a culture closely and appreciating what is good about it, it really encourages us to, to say, oh, you know what? This is something so good that I'm doing and I need to preserve it, or I need to showcase it, or I need to really carry the story to the world. So if I were to, at this point again, I'm sorry, I'm butting in again, uh, to ask you uh, the three most endearing things to you about India. Oof, it's very it's difficult very to say. Tough, it's um, very tough, but I'm still going to push you to identify three things. Right. In that process, you can tell me 30 others and say, oh no, out of these 30, these are the three. <laughs> So I know I'll be, I'll be specific. So the food is unequivocally the best in the world. <laughs> I'm going to say that hand, hands down. <laughs> Just there's, there's no, Nepal came close. Nepal came really, really close. But North Indian foods, tandoori food is, is, as far as I'm concerned, the best in the world by a mile. We were so lucky on the trip in 2019 to have, have Bindu and have Nilanjan Mukherjee and the other people we traveled with who really understood Indian food and they they made sure that we saw the best of it so it, there were no Maggie noodles on, on that trip it, it was it was at the opposite end of the culinary spectrum and yeah India should be proud of that it's because it's because it's quite something and it's a, it's a massive export if you look in the UK the number of people that that, that want to go for an Indian, as, as, as we say, whether or not it's Bangladeshi or Pakistani or wherever, wherever it ends up being from, it, it, it's that's a, a point of Indian culture which has traveled the world and, and represents you very, very well. I'd say secondly, secondly is the colors. Um, where, when you just look at the saris that are being worn by people absolutely everywhere, and this could be in your cities or, or, or in your tribal communities, the, the colours and the and the sounds, so the the, the interblending of uh, of those visual stimuli into your lives. Uh, look at what I'm wearing. Look how look how bland this this is. And I I'm an average Brit. I'm I'm in blue with khaki trousers. That's what British people wear. We wear blue with khaki trousers. How boring is that? Whereas at the opposite end of the spectrum was. The, the people in the Bodoland people up in up in Manas, just a, a, an unbelievable profusion of colours, um, which and they're very proud of that culture. That they're, they're on their smartphones, they're engaged with the world, but they still retain that culture. They, they have their songs, their their dance, and for me to be able to witness that, see that blending of cultures, but how proud they were of what they had was wonderful, and that was made all the more spectacular by the the incredible visual stimuli that that we had, the, the, these incredible colours opposite end of the sartorial spectrum from where I'm sat at the moment and then finally I think it is your wildlife and it's your little things so the the, the biodiversity of the western ghats is something else when you've got you've got elephants living in the forest you've got king cobras you've you've got 
such an enormous diversity of in insects and other invertebrates, many of which won't have yet been identified, won't yet have, have species names. You've got this phenomenal wildlife. And I think, I think it's really important for Indian people to appreciate that as well. And the importance that this biodiversity gives to society. Right? At the most fundamental level, we, we need biodiversity for, for clean air and clean water and for the pollination services and all of the other ecosystem services we get. But we also need it for our own mental health. And, and I'm sure during COVID, a lot of people have sought refuge and solace in wild places. They, you, you would, in, in the center of, um, of Mumbai to have, have the national park in the center of Mumbai okay. to be able to to escape the busyness, the, the chaos or the, the stress of what's going on and go for a walk and have the prospect of watching langurs throwing themselves off trees and having a bath, to see the chital deer walk past, to, to, to see a footprint of a leopard, to, ha to have, to have Sanjay, Sanjay Gandhi National Park in the heart of your city. I, it, that is a jewel in the crown which needs to be protected, but all of your protected areas and your wild places need to be protected for, for your physical health and for your mental health and for your cultural health. It's a part of your cultural heritage that you should be proud of. Ma'am, I think in the, in the interest of time that is ticking, I think we need to come back to the, the final section, which is the most important mm. and one that Nile and I would love to you know, talk about to the viewers, where Nile visited in 2019 when he was part of the, the biggest in Paris series for Animal Planet, which was directed by Griffin Films Canada. Um, the team that came down, Peter von Putkama, Todd Southgate, the cinematographer, Andy Dietrich, the photographer, and all this represented by Felix Creations, the Bangalore-based um, wildlife filmmaking company, which I represented um, as the local expert and the cultural guide. So Nile and team were, they covered West Bengal, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and yeah, the entire Western Ghats, uh, Gumbay and so on. They had a fascinating trip and I'm, I'm saying that was like a cultural popuri um, of a trip because it was. it was so different. Like Nile had been to Delhi and when he came to Chennai, my city, um, it was it was so different. Like I said, he hadn't seen something like that before. And we took him, we took this whole team to Mahabalipuram and you know that is where we're talking about Stuart should pro probably come down next and see the place right because we're talking about geology and um, so much so much to discover right there in our backyard and we didn't think it was so great but you know when people come from outside and look at it it's a completely different view so Nile, perhaps this is when you should tell us about that shoot it, it was a, a wonderful wonderful trip five weeks in india four states and and some fantastic cultural guides. <laughs> we were incredibly lucky that that's Ardesh at Phyllis Productions. He's he's obviously a genius himself. He he and he, he was able to put together this incredible itinerary for us, and some wonderful people such as yourself and Nilanjan Mukherjee, and the other people that help helps take us around the country and 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 give us that taste of India. And so we legendary, start... sorry, Romulus Vitaker. Well, I, I was going to get yes. to Romulus, of yes. course, because. Yes. Um, Romulus is a is a legend who is as well known here in the UK probably as he is in uh, in, in India and one of those people who I'd I'd grown up watching on television and so it's a true privilege to actually spend some time with him and find out how humble and funny and down to earth he is as well as being a phenomenal herpetologist and, and just just a wonderful icon. But we started in West Bengal where we were working with um, Aritra Kshetri who's an almost farcically talented young scientist, kind of one of, one of those individuals who, who, whose, whose intellect operates on a different plane to, to the rest of humanity. And he's doing some incredible work on, on human elephant conflict in, in, in West Bengal, which is a fascinating area of subject of, of study for me. I do a lot of work with elephants in Africa. So this was particularly interested. From there, we, we traveled down to Tamil Nadu, some, some time in Chennai and uh, vis visited uh, the Madras crocodile, uh, the same sanctuary where, uh, where Romulus works and his, his incredible staff, Ajay. We got to spend some time with the, uh, with the local indigenous people there that, that's, that used to capture snakes and sell them skins and now they catch snakes and they, 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 they milk the venom to try and create um, well, it's the Serum Institute, so they're trying to create um, anti-venom snake bites a very serious problem in India and, and it's an incredibly worthwhile use of those cultural skills 
to still find and catch snakes and, and, and milk them and create these antivenoms from that. That was a, a truly wonderful experience going out with these, these indigenous snake hunters, um, catching, catching snakes alive, but seeing their, their, their bravery and their skill. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with snakes, but these guys were on another level, just on another, it was second nature. Handling a snake was like handling a pen for those guys. It's just, 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 just totally second nature and an amazing experience. Plus, of course, the Chennai coffee that, that you insisted I had every single morning <laughs> to, to, to kick the day off yeah. uh, was a particularly pleasurable part of, uh, of our time in, in Tamil Nadu. In terms of uniqueness, spending, spending a week at the Agumbe Rainforest Research Centre in Karnataka was, was really special. So being in, in a rainforest environment, I love, I spent so much time in rainforests in Latin America in particular. Did my PhD in, in a in rainforest, cloud forest environment in, in Honduras. So, so going out every single night with our torches to spot wildlife, seeing bush babies, see, 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 seeing incredible species of spider, seeing these, these flying lizards. And then the focus for being there was king cobras. And so to have this 14 foot long cobra going through the environment, people being essentially tolerant of them. I thought was was quite remarkable. The amazing thing that Romulus's team, uh, led by Ajay Giri, are doing out in in Agumbe is they are sensitizing local people to to snakes. Snakes are a, are a part of your environment. They're part of your natural heritage, and they should be a point of pride that you have this amazing diversity of snakes that can, they control rodent numbers and do do other very important ecosystem services. But they 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 do make people afraid no matter where you are in the world and Ajay and his team are doing an incredible job at sensitizing local people to snakes so that these are a natural part of your environment and if you treat them with respect you will have absolutely no problems with them and they, they perform an incredible local service kind of a, a 999 service if, if, if you find a snake in your in your house or on your property you call Ajay and he comes and he'll, he'll do a sensitization program and, and then take the snake and release it back in the wild. And finally, we ended up back in, Ma in Maharashtra, um, in Mumbai, working with, with Nikit Surf and, uh, and, and Krishna, I forget, I forget his name, it was Krishna Tiwari, who are two leopard scientists who've been doing incredible work at looking at human leopard conflict in, in Mumbai and how the Adivasi people live on the doorstep of the, of the, of the, of the forest. And therefore they're interfacing with leopards all the time and how people come to terms with having an ostensibly dangerous animal in their midst, but in living with them in, in comparative harmony, essentially suffering uh, or, or almost no negative effects of having them nearby and, and tolerating, not just tolerating them, but enjoying the fact that they live with these wonderful animals that are represented in some of their deities with Vagavar, for example. So it was that, that, that trip to those four areas and everything that came, came with it was, just a, a, an amazing experience all to be making a big film which has got which has gone around the world or three 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 episodes of a documentary that's gone around the world i must uh quick shout out to, to sampat our sound man who who, who was um from india mm -hmm. and has his own sound studio and was an amazing companion uh and and did a great job uh, helping pull the film together as well yeah so you actually, you covered more than, um, I would say, four in that trip, four parts of uh, our country. What was, what yeah. was different, what was unique, what was, what was so, uh, you know, memorable for you among, among all the four that you covered? Yeah, each has its own flavour, of course. Um, so West Bengal is still quite sparsely populated which, which it, well, certainly the places that we were, when we were in, the, in the more remote areas. Um, kind of Bucks and Tiger Reserve and those, those kind of areas. So, so beautiful, lush rainforests, great big rivers, all of this type of stuff that people don't necessarily think of when, when, when they're thinking of India. Enormous trees, wonderful big, big trees and all of the wildlife that goes, that goes with that. Quite high densities of elephants, really quite amazing. And then, like, the Western Ghats, I just... To, to that mountain scenery I find inspirational anyway to be there but then knowing that under under every rock or every leaf there's a, a species of animal that may never have been described when I, I took a photograph of a tiny little thing it was a, a mantis which which looks like an ant and speaking to, to, to Dr. Sashadri who is one of our, our guides there 
um, the Agumbe Reverence Research Centre, he said that, that that's probably not got a, a, a name, that's probably not been described before. And he, he said that's the case with so many of these species that, that you're seeing here. So that, that was truly unique. One thing that stayed the same throughout was was just the standard of food. <laughs> the standard of food was unbelievable. Uh, that was kind of down to you and uh, and Neil and Jan and our, and our other guys just made sure that no matter where we went, we ate we ate like kings. It was yeah quite something. We had a biryani in Mumbai. Each each mouthful was an explosion of taste and sensation that I have never been able to replicate with a meal before or after. I, I, I will I will go to my deathbed that that was the best thing I will I would have <laughs> ever eaten and I, I don't know how they did it I don't know how they did it but it was something else yeah quite something and the difference in the breads that you said right from the south to the north I mean yeah so things like paratha in the north and parota in the south taste and feel and everything is so different I I love naan, so so I, I always defaulted to naan whenever we had the option. But to to, to enjoy the experience of the others was, was was great. And you giving me rice cakes with gunpowder and all, yeah. all, all this type of stuff, I, I I can't remember whether I enjoyed that or not. The fact that I can't remember it means I probably didn't. I probably wiped it from my memory. <laughs> but everything else that you showed us, we absolutely loved, of course. Yeah, I think the spice was a little too much for you to go down. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps, but I, I'm good with spice. And I love the fact that when you, when you see someone preparing a meal, as we, one of the hotels that we stayed in didn't, didn't have a kitchen. So, so, so the, the guys that prepared our food just, just did it on the floor of the hotel. And you'd see all of the ingredients laid out beforehand. And there would be a, a, a bunch of chilies <laughs> this, this big, ready to go into a meal for five people. And that was, goodness, that was something else. But yeah, I loved it. And not, not one upset stomach from any of us in the entire trip. So that, that, there's another thing that people assume when you come to India, the deli belly is, is, is something that people assume. We didn't have a single upset stomach uh, from, the entire, from the entire crew for the whole trip for five weeks. Thank you, Niall. I think we're, we're coming to 12 noon. I can see the time here. I'm just thinking that uh, I hope the viewers have taken that one big message that um, you don't necessarily go and see wildlife, which means it's just tigers, but there's so much more out there, um, you know, that, that, that kind of brings the ecosystem together. And there's so much natural heritage for us to discover, even as Indians, leave alone people coming from outside. Um, so if there was one message from you to kind of wrap up the session, um, what would it be? It would be be proud of your cultural heritage and your natural heritage and protect them both because they are they are invaluable. They, they give us so much. They give you so much as, as Indians and they give us so much as visitors. So, yeah, protect your cultural and your natural heritage because it's, it's the most important thing on Earth. Ms. Brar, I think... Um... Would you like to come in uh, because Bhati has been there and I'm wondering if she has a question before we let Nile go? Of course. Uh, before this, uh, when we were just talking, before the webinar started, I saw some lovely photographs uh, that you have taken during your trip to India. I'd like to see them uh, with you now. Uh, I'll, I'll like, skim through a yeah. few because yeah. yeah. I'm aware yeah. we're, we're quite How sure. you captured <laughs> India through the lens. Yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll... I just show a few. So, um, Bindu, can you let me know if you can see my screen? Yeah, I can. Great. So, early on, here's a shot. There's a photograph from just north of Manali, where a landslip had come across the road, and the as you can see, the river running down the road that we were cycling up. And this is an example of the incredible scenery that we that we were seeing on that first trip, and each of the each of the passes we would go over would have these, these wonderful prayer flags everywhere. This was a pass at 5,100 meters high. That's, that's my brother. Um, so quite, quite an extraordinary thing to see. You can see how arid this is as well. Very, very dry because we're now over in Ladakh. Um, and this is my, my favorite photograph from that trip. The, the road construction company that, that built this road mm -hmm. considered themselves pretty tough. And they, they, they erected this sign saying, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And uh, yeah, we, we were trying to live up to their toughness ourselves at, at that time. The road signs all along the way were quite something, encouraging people to be to, to drive carefully and drive with respect. So you'd, uh, there'd be lots of innuendos in the road signs. So go gentle on my curves. They, they'd say better to be a better to be 
a late mister than a, it's better be a mister late than a late mister and all, all of these little innuendos as we're going through um so then on to manas national park as i said i was um spending some time with with the anti-poaching groups there from the forestry department you can see a lot of these guys are, are very bodo in their appearance and wonderful team hugely dedicated to protecting the tigers and the rhinos and the elephants in particular of this national park and it's just truly beautiful scenery wonderfully lush look at all the epiphytes on the trees just so lush and the wildlife that came with it about two minutes after this photograph was taken we all had to run up one of the trees because a buffalo came charging through <laughs> came charging through the group and it was yeah, incredible for elephants as well as a, a nice tusker with with the, with the sun going down um and a quick quick photograph of of, of me with a beard that's what i look like with with facial hair and and that's the skull of a gower that we found on the on, on the ground just that's that's a truly extraordinary animal um so yeah wonderful trip and and, and I, I mentioned the the, the colors the, the bodoland people and the, the the wonderful the songs and the and the, the music the dancing and you see the, the sashes that they're wearing behind i have three of those here at home um, which which i brought back with me and i've uh, I have a, a cookery from the area as well, which I'm very proud of. That was an, an incredible trip. And then up into, with, with the filming, so here's a photograph I have to show of the food. Was the, the, our best best few hours of every single day was whenever we were eating. <laughs> There's <laughs> Peter, the director, and Todd, the cameraman, and Andy, the, uh, the photographer, and Arethro, and Nil and Jan in the, in the background. Um, I mentioned the guys preparing the food on the floor. Here they are, preparing the food on the floor of the hotel. Pile of chilies that was about to go into our meal. That was that was one hell of a meal that night. I, re I remember. It was a pretty incredible experience spending time with some of the tribals as well, and just yeah, real difference in culture between these guys and between people like Nilanjan and and uh, Arethro, who are very westernized in many ways, but but still maintain their cult their. Uh, their Indian culture, whereas these guys are still very much living a culture that would have been the same for, for hundreds of years. We were very lucky to arrive in uh, what do you mean? Right at the very end of Holi <laughs> and to be welcomed in with open arms and, uh, and, and wide eyes by this by, by several groups of, of party revelers. You mentioned Mahabalapuram. Oh, yes. Uh, it's just an incredible place. And again, something I didn't know that India had that level of, um, of architectural, archeological history. Um, so just to see that was, was truly special. Um, I, I love this little shot. It's just, it shows the, the joy of the children and, and the, how much fun we were having in interacting with people all the way along the way. And yeah, kind of finally that experience, yeah. this, is a, this is us, that's a king cobra and a python locked in a death match. That's, that's possibly the most remarkable natural history encounter I've ever had. I've, I've had a couple. I've been charged by a tiger. Uh, I've had an elephant put me up into a tree. Those were pretty special. But this, to spend 45 minutes watching a king cobra battling a python, that's up there with the most special things I've ever seen in my life. And, and I was lucky to get this photograph as well in a gumbe of yeah. the uh of, yeah the flying lizard which, which was quite something and uh, yeah f finally i'll i'll, I'll leave uh, leave a photograph of of the film crew uh, actually no one one more thing walking through the slum in in mumbai my goodness there was a wedding was happening or, or this is just before the wedding where, where, <laughs> where they're covering the, the the groom in turmeric and me and the cameraman todd had, had taken a different different way up to where we were to film and we walked past this wedding and instead of being asked to leave we were immediately invited in covered <laughs> in turmeric as you can see uh ha hand handed a drink and just welcomed to the party it was absolutely wonderful i, I love this woman here this, look at the smile on her face on the right just brilliant it was incredibly generous of them to have to have us in uh and yeah i'll, I'll leave you with that, that shot there's 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 the crew Krishna in the background, and Sam Pat, our sound man, myself with a, with a little spectacle cobra, Andy Dietrich, Todd Southgate, and Peter von Puckhammer. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, that's just a very quick whistle stop through. I've got. I'm not sure you're quite a brave heart, Nyan. Like, uh, 
so close to the snake and <laughs> and oh, of course snake, the picture snake. is uh, speaks more than 1000 words like the kind of experience you talked about we could actually experience it through the images that yeah what you saw in india and what you talked about is it was all there yeah and i think you know, was, one thing uh, i'm sorry yeah, yeah go ahead go ahead just what i, what I wanted to show from those photographs thing. what i wanted to show from those photographs was, was that people and animals are, are, are so intermingled and that's the wonderful thing that 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 human culture and that wildlife culture are are, are very intermingled in india and and that that needs protecting yeah so what i was saying in the same same line is that um i think people who work with nature i i notice this is they're very good at heart i i think they're absolutely humble they're so uh, connected with people and the soil makes them good human beings and i've seen you know this is dr nail mekin i you know then then you have romulus witaker and you know people like them when you actually meet them and you start working with them you don't you don't feel intimidated with their with the knowledge or their experience this this so comfortable with anybody they meet or any any environment you put in because i think they work with nature they work with the, you know the soil every day and that teaches you that when you sit in a corporate uh, you know world you probably get a little less view of what is there outside right you you're like frogs in a well you have to step out you have to go out there into the into the wild into the outdoors and then once in a while at least experience what it is like to be with nature especially i think during covid this is something we've learned um it's nice Great. to go out there into rural india especially absolutely so nile before we let you go back maybe to catch a few winks again uh, when you are to india where are you coming to Kerala. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I will be back in India, and as soon as I possibly can. And one of the things I, I'm really looking forward to is I have a two-year-old daughter, and uh, I obviously hope she'll be a biologist. Um, and I, I want to take take her and show her some of the amazing diversity that I've been lucky enough to witness and and meet the people. Uh, I'm obviously I'm still in touch with Bindu, but I'm still in touch with Nilanj and Mukherjee on, on WhatsApp all the time. And I, I want my daughter to meet meet them and. Uh, and have some of those similar experiences but in terms of where would i like to go myself that i haven't been before there's there's two places in particular at, at opposite ends of the country so starting in in kerala um bindu is kerala's biggest advocate and <laughs> she keeps she keeps on trying to set, sell sell it to me so i'll i'll buy I, i've got to go visit kerala and uh, and experience the food and the, and the people and and everything that's down there and then secondly i have i i have a fascination with tribal peoples and their interaction with with the natural world and so i want to go to nagaland i want to spend some time up, up there in the northeast in nagaland interacting with the tribals there and and seeing how they interface with wildlife as well and and seeing some of the wildlife in that part of the country as well as the scenery that that's that's a trip i'd love to do sometime Fantastic. So we are waiting for you. Welcome to India. Very soon, we are sure that we shall have these days of the pandemic behind us, and travel will be safe once again. Till then, we can all keep researching. We can keep looking up webinars like these. Lots of material that's available on the Incredible India's website, and so many other resources. So make your holiday plans, viewers. Start doing your bookings because it's the spirit in I think humanity which. every single time that there is a diversity that uh, an adversity that has come we have been able to defeat it and mankind if we look back even in times that there were no aeroplane there were no cars there were no automobiles but people were traveling on foot i think that the desire to travel the desire to go to other cultures the desire to just share learn and appreciate about each other is so innate to the human mind that travels are not going anywhere so we are sure the travels are going to be back but for a while yes we do need to be careful we need to keep wearing our mask keep keeping the social distancing and keep researching on our incredible india i am going to at this point of time uh, thank nail nail thank you so very much for coming in at a very early hour for you that's one part of our appreciation but also the fact that you have chosen to come to india three times already and that you're looking forward to coming again and that you're going to be also bringing your young child and making her learn and appreciate about our beautiful country so we thank people like you who make us proud about our own country and um, thank you bindu for navigating and steering today's conversation it's been a fantastic conversation the comments that are coming in are really really 
very heartwarming for us and so viewers. We've been bringing to you the Dekho Apna Desh webinar series from the 14th of April last year. And while we have absolutely no intention of stopping because the kind of ideas that one is getting from all of you, the way you want to host, because always it's is your program, we are just a platform. And so we have lots of you coming up with ideas, but for the next couple of weeks, we are going to take a short little break because the team needs to reassemble. There have been some transfers, people have moved out, it's the annual time of the year when there are changes happening and also a lot of people currently are looking after their families and themselves in times of COVID. So we are going to take a break for a couple of weeks, not for very long, just enough for you to go and revisit the 88 episodes that we've been running. Go see them again, visit them, they are beautiful places, start taking your little notes in your travel journals as to where are you going to be going next. And where are you going to find the King Cobra is something that you can ask Niall about. So, so thank you viewers. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience for Dekho Apna Desh. As I said, we shall be back very, very soon. Maybe just a couple of weeks is all we need to do to reassemble and we shall keep you notified. But in the meantime, on the Ministry of Tourism's website, under the Dekho Apna Desh, you can find the recordings of all the webinars done till now. Please see them. Also send us ideas. If any of you want to host a program with us, you're more than welcome to come forth with your ideas. It's your beautiful country and we want you to showcase it just the way you want people to see your beautiful country. So that's uh, all for now today. And so thank you, Dr. Niall McCann for joining us. Thank you, Bindu for hosting us. Thank you, Bharti. Thank you, Team NEGD. Thank you, all my people in the office who've been really holding the fort in these difficult times. And thank you, viewers. Because of you, we are there. We shall be back really, really very soon. Namaste. Thank you, Nile, And thank you to the whole MOT team. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.